Greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Today, we're going to be talking about Peyronie's disease, and we're very fortunate to have two experts joining us. My name is Dr. Scott Lundy. I'll be moderating. And our two specialists here to discuss Peyronie's disease in detail are Dr. Peter Bayich. Dr. Bayich did his fellowship training with Dr. Larry Levine and focused specifically on Peyronie's disease and erectile dysfunction. He practices at the Cleveland Clinic main campus and at the Independence Family Health Center. Our other panelist this evening is Dr. Neil Parikh. He's also an expert in Peyronie's disease and erectile dysfunction and did a fellowship at Cleveland Clinic in these areas and in male infertility. And he primarily practices in the Akron, Fairlawn, and Medina offices. So what we're going to do this evening and discuss all aspects of Peyronie's disease from how the disease forms and the consequences as well as the medical and surgical treatments of this disease. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bayich, who will uh, begin our presentation this evening. All right, uh, thanks so much everybody for tuning in. Um, I just wanted to apologize ahead of time for this gorgeous view that you'll see behind me for wrapping up our spring break here in Florida. So I know it's probably not exactly warm like this in Cleveland, which I'll soon find out tomorrow. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some background info for uh, Peyronie's disease, uh, which is a condition that's kind of near and dear uh, to my heart. Um, so what we're really talking about with Peyronie's disease is actually a deformity of the erect penis. And usually um, when we think about this condition or when you might see it talked about on commercials and things like that, it's usually relating to a penile curvature, but there are other aspects of it that we'll get into. But basically what happens is uh, scar tissue develops in the penis. We think probably in response to little microscopic injuries that might happen during regular sexual activity. And this is interestingly something that's quite common. It can affect up to 10% of men at some point in their life. And during the first uh, six to 18 months of this condition, there's actually a chance that things can get worse. Actually 90% of cases will either stay the same or get worse. Uh, particularly beyond those first 18 months, it's very unlikely to get better on its own, which is unfortunately one of the challenges with this condition. It's really important, though, to realize that this does not lead to any kind of cancer or other health problems. This purely affects a man's um, ability to have sexual intercourse and also his own self-image as his, the appearance of his penis may have changed. This condition is distinguished from curvature that's been present uh, for a man's entire life. Some men are actually born with curvature that first typically becomes apparent around adolescence or their teenage years when they reach peak sexual maturity, that's actually a different condition. We call that congenital curvature, and that's kind of a different thing. But Peyronie's is something that's acquired later in life, most commonly in men in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. So as I mentioned, this is a scarring condition. Um, it can cause curvature, it can cause shortening, it can cause a loss of girth. And that scar tissue that forms in this condition can uh, interfere with erectile function, meaning it can cause ED or erectile dysfunction. It can also lead to pain, difficulty with sexual intercourse. And as you see there in that image um, on the right, the on the top surface of the penis, there's kind of a little line pointing to a scar uh, and the penis is kind of curving upward. So if you imagine the penis is a balloon that's supposed to expand in length and girth, as that balloon expands, if there's scar tissue along the top surface of the penis, that surface is less elastic. So, because it can't expand properly, the penis is going to curve in the direction of the scar tissue. So, this is proposed to be a wound healing disorder or basically an abnormal over exuberant scar tissue formation that happens probably in response to injury. Although 80% of guys that have this don't remember some specific event that led to it, uh, that's just the leading hypothesis at this point. As I mentioned, this because the scar is less stretchy, that surface of the penis doesn't expand and you get the curvature, as you see here in this picture on the right. So how does an erection work? Well, when a man gets aroused, meaning what happens up here when he gets turned on, signals are sent through the nerves of the penis that then become active. They stimulate all the way down in the penis um, arteries, basically muscles in the walls of arteries that then relax, opening those arteries further and letting more blood flow into the penis. This allows the penis to fill up with blood. 
And then once the pressure inside the penis becomes great enough, a series of valves actually close to help hold that blood in. Um, from that pressure, that's basically what, and, and the closure of those valves, that's basically what allows us to maintain an erection. And then after climax, those valves open up and the erection goes down. Next slide. So the way that Peyronie's can affect erectile dysfunction, and this is also a hypothesis, we don't necessarily know for sure, but this is kind of one of the leading schools of thought, uh, that scar tissue actually prevents those valves from closing properly. So what you get is blood comes in and then comes right back out. We call that venous leak, and that can lead to either poorly maintained erections or incomplete erections. However, there is another link between Peyronie's and ED, and that is the explanation for why this condition doesn't happen to men until usually their 50s or 60s, because that's also the time in life when the erections have a tendency to get weaker. So inadequate erections can sometimes predispose a man to injure his penis. It's, it's more difficult to injure the erect penis when it's a 10 out of 10 rock hard erection. So a little bit of ED may predispose to the Peyronie's, which then after you get it may further worsen the erectile dysfunction. Next slide. So as I mentioned, in the first six to 18 months of this condition, things are kind of evolving, okay? Either in response to some injury, or maybe we don't really have an explanation for it, but there's a lot of inflammation. And during that period of time, a man might experience pain with erections or even just at rest without an erection. During this period of time, there's a potential for the deformity to actually get worse, okay? So when we refer to the active or acute phase, that's these first six to 18 months. Once the deformity has been unchanged for six months, the man then become, or enters into what we call the stable or chronic phase. Usually during this phase, the pain typically resolves, although not 100% of the time. And typically the deformity at that point is not going to get any better. It's not going to get any worse, except under very rare circumstances. Next slide. Now, how can Peyronie's affect a man's life? Well, primarily this affects his quality of life. It can have a negative impact on his sexual function, on his own body self image, which are both very reasonable you know, reasons to come and get it checked out. It can also put strain on a man's relationship with his partner. Next slide. As far as for men that may not have this condition or maybe have a family history of it and they're worried about getting it themselves, how can we reduce our risk of this? Well, we wanna to try to improve our overall health and make healthy choices. For example, eating the right things, preventing, you know, avoiding getting diabetes and high cholesterol and things that can lead to erectile dysfunction. Regular cardiovascular exercise where you're getting out of breath is gonna help improve blood flow to the penis and strengthen erections. Losing weight is also important uh, to help prevent ED. And really importantly here, Quitting smoking if you are a smoker, because smoking is in and of itself a major risk factor for both Peyronie's disease and ED. For men that maybe already have some degree of erectile dysfunction, we want to try to strengthen the erections as much as possible to help prevent injury to the penis. So things like Viagra and Cialis, and for men who those medications may not work, there's a number of other options that we'll talk about today. Next slide. So how do we diagnose Peyronie's disease? Well, the most important part of it is hearing the history from the guy who thinks he may have it, okay? We do a basic evaluation, meaning obtaining a comprehensive sexual uh, health history. We do a focused physical examination to check the you know, penis and uh, also testicles to see, look for any other abnormalities. And typically we recommend additional diagnostic testing. Now there's some variability from provider to provider. There's no hard and fast rule necessarily about how Peyronie's needs to be worked up, but most providers will incorporate either a penile injection to create an artificial erection to evaluate the deformity or use some type of home photography. Um, however, sometimes the home photography may not provide the most accurate representation of what's going on. There's also a test uh, called a penile Doppler ultrasound, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then sometimes if there's erectile dysfunction present as well, we may consider some other testing and even blood work. So just to give you an idea of how Peyronie's disease might progress, this is uh, all images from, a, from the same guy. This first image was how it started and it progressed. 
and it progressed and it progressed. Okay, and then it ultimately stabilized in this position. So this would be considered a pretty severe case. These are two different guys here on the next slide. Uh, an upward curvature of almost 90 degrees in the image on the left. The guy on the right here has what looks like an up and to the left curvature along with a little twist of the penis. And you also see that there's some difference in the girth here where the, the middle of the shaft looks thinner than the end. So the, the Peyronie scar can limit the expansion both in length and girth. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that the penis can be affected. Next slide. So penile Doppler ultrasound is a test uh, that's done in the office. Um, and basically, it lets us evaluate the scar using ultrasound. What it can tell us is whether there are calcifications inside the scar tissue, which is kind of like bone formation that can actually happen in the scar. That happens in about one in three men. And there's some thought that calcified scar tissue may be less likely to respond to certain treatments, like, for example, the Zyaflex, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. This also gives us an opportunity during this test to give a medicine directly into the penis that creates an erection so that we can assess the deformity in three dimensions. And then during that test with the erection, we can actually measure the blood flow. We can measure how much blood is coming in and whether there's any blood leaking out. So for men that have some ED related to this, we can try to figure out, is it more related to his diabetes or is it more related to the Peyronie's disease? And this helps us kind of develop a treatment plan. Now, like I said, this is an optional test. It doesn't always change what we're gonna recommend, but it's just something uh, to be aware of. Next slide. So when it, we, when it comes to treatment for Peyronie's disease, we wanna make sure that you know, you know all the different options that are available. There's kind of you know, always something new on the horizon. And you know, even in the last 10 years, there's been some new treatments that have come out. Um, so we wanna present all those options and then through a shared decision-making approach, kind of engaging you, the patient, figure out what solution might be best for you because there's not you know, one hammer for every nail. So Dr. Park is now gonna get into the non-surgical treatment options for Peyronie's disease, and then I'll come back with some surgical options. Thanks, Dr. Bayich. I'm Dr. Park. I'm gonna share some of the non-surgical treatment options that we have for Peyronie's disease. Next slide. So as we already touched on, there are two phases, the active phase and the stable phase. So when patients come in uh, during that acute or active phase, which is the first six to 18 uh, months, uh, we're trying to prevent worsening of the curvature. Um, there are the treatments that we have during the active phase aren't trying to necessarily fix the condition uh, because we really advise against any sort of aggressive uh, surgeries or procedures during the active phase because things can continue to change. So. Sometimes patients uh, are disappointed that there isn't a lot that we can do during the active phase, uh, but I'll go over more of this in the next couple of slides. Then you have the stable phase. Um, so stable during the stable phase, uh, we're uh, basically offering some non-surgical therapy uh, if patients really aren't interested in some of the, the other sort of treatment options or aren't really mentally ready for, for surgery at this point. Next slide. So this slide here, I don't expect uh, you all to be able to read, but really just highlights uh, the vast number of different non-surgical treatment options that have uh, been per, uh, described in the literature. Uh, and this uh, can be sometimes daunting for not only patients, but also physicians. Not all urologists are necessarily comfortable treating uh, Peyronie's disease. Uh, a lot of it has to do because uh, they're has been significant changes throughout history, and there is no um, consistent or, or great guideline-based treatment uh, as far as non-surgical uh, treatments. Next slide. So typically, uh, when we, we start oral medications, uh, there are a few that we use, but we have to highlight, and there you can see it's highlighted in red and underlined, that there are no oral medications that have been proven to improve penile deformity due to Peyronie's disease. Uh, and the American Urological Association has highlighted several of these medications that should not be used, such as vitamin E uh, and plus or minus L-carnitine, tamoxifen, 
uh, procarbazine, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, topical uh, rapamil with or without an electromotive drug administration. So while I don't see many patients coming to me having been put on these medications, um, that's just uh, something important to note. Now, the medications that you know, Dr. Bayich and I typically use are listed here in yellow, um, specifically uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as Tadalafil or Cialis. Um, the daily Cialis uh, comes in a five milligram dose, and, and there are animal studies that have shown it to prevent uh, some degree of scarring. Uh, so we typically put patients on Cialis daily during this active or acute phase uh, to help prevent progression. And I think, you know, that's something that most urologists uh, are comfortable uh, prescribing, uh, but not all patients are, are offered this therapy because there really, again, isn't great guideline ev evidence to say that it, it helps. But anecdotally, uh, you know, I have seen patients come back after a three-month trial of Cialis saying that uh, the curvature is slightly improved or the curvature hasn't worsened, and that's really the goal uh, during the acute phase. Next slide. So here's a fairly uh, newer uh, treatment modality, uh, penile traction therapy, uh, specifically the Restorex. This is the first FDA-approved device to be used for this condition. Um, typically, patients are recommended to, to wear this device uh, 30 to 90 minutes a day. I typically recommend patients to use it 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. Um, while that is a, a significant amount of time, uh, you know, it has been affected, and I'll show that later. Um, it's also uh, been shown to treat length loss uh, that we see after uh, ED and after prostate surgery. Um, most men don't realize that after prostate surgery, you know, they will uh, definitely or likely lose some of that penile length. And for every year that patients suffer from ED or impotence, uh, they continue to, to lose length, you know, a half centimeter to a centimeter. And this has been shown uh, to help treat that. Unfortunately, this is not typical uh, rare or rarely covered by insurance and is roughly $500 on their website. Um, but this is a nice non-surgical, uh, non-medical treatment uh, that is an option for a lot of guys. And, you know, I give... Uh, almost all patients a brochure about this device uh, when they come to see me for Peyronie's disease. Next slide. So the goals of traction therapy uh, is to one, recover lost length, as that is something that most patients will mention in the office. You know, once they develop uh, the scar tissue or feel the plaque, uh, they will also report some loss of length. Uh, it has been also shown to reduce curvature, an average of 20%. Uh, percent and can stop uh, progression of the deformity during that active or acute phase. Also, it's a nice option to avoid um, surgery, if that's what a patient uh, prefers, and it may also help with any future uh, surgery if that is ultimately the path uh, the patient goes on. So this slide uh, just shows uh, the length improvement uh, after six months of using this device, and you can see uh, the length improved by an average of two centimeters at six months. The other non-surgical treatment that we have is Zyaflex. Uh, so this was the first FDA-approved treatment that we had for Peyronie's disease, and this was back in 2013. Um, many patients uh, may come into the office familiar with this medication as there is a lot of advertising around it. Um, and the way it works is, it's a, basically a medication that's injected into the scar tissue, uh, which then dissolves that scar tissue. Now, it does not differentiate between healthy and diseased tissue, so there are some risks with it. Uh, but it is an option for men in the stable phase, uh, so that's after uh, the plaque or the curvature has been stable for six months. Um, and also, the plaque should be uh, palpable. So, uh, when we examine you in the office, we should be able to feel the scar tissue, that way we know where uh, to inject the medication. Uh, at a minimum, the curvature should be at least 30 degrees, uh, but no more than 90 degrees. Uh, the curvature uh, 
can be dorsal or upwards towards uh, the head or to the side, but it should not, or it's not FDA approved or indicated when the curve is ventral or, or pointed downwards towards the ground or with what we call an hourglass, hourglass deformity. Um, kind of, uh, if you remember the last picture Dr. Byatt showed where there was thinning of the, the penis, that's what we uh, consider an hourglass deformity. Now, patients, if they elect this uh, treatment, uh, should have good erections, you know, with or without assistance of, you know, Viagra or Cialis, um, but it but it's also uh, less effective in men that have calcifications, and those calcifications can uh, be picked up on the penile duplex ultrasound or on physical exam. Next slide. So here are the risks. Uh, I, obviously, these aren't all of them, but these are are the ones uh, that we should be aware about. Uh, most commonly is the bruising. Uh, most men will have some bruising and ecchymosis of the penile shaft. Uh, while it can be uh, look worrisome, it's very common. Uh, and uh, in most uh, most cases after Zyflex in injection, you also have some swelling that typically is temporary. Uh, now, it is a needle into the penis, so I'm pretty upfront with patients. You know, it, it is uncomfortable uh, to receive the injection in the office, uh, but it is temporary. Um, the most worrisome uh, risk would be rupture of the penile tissue or penile fracture. Uh, now, this is less than 1%. Uh, patients are advised uh, against any sex sexual activity for four weeks after their last injection. And this, uh, by following that strict guideline, can help uh, prevent this um, issue. Next slide. So, uh, realistic expectations in regards to Zyflex, you know, it is not a cure. Um, it's unlikely to completely uh, correct the curvature. You know, I explained to patients, unlikely the, pa the penis will be completely straight after uh, Zyflex treatment, and the average degree of improvement in curvature is 17 degrees. Now, we can stop treatment at any point uh, during the cycles, uh, during the course of treatment for Zyflex, uh, once the patient feels that the curvature has Im improved enough uh, where they uh, are able to penetrate or aren't bar bothered by it. Um, it's not shown to restore length or girth loss and unfortunately can be very expensive, uh, but fortunately in the United States is, is typically covered by insurance. Next slide. So, once again, Zyflex is an in-office injection, um, and it's important to do a good physical exam to identify the best candidates. Uh, we oftentimes uh, perform penile ultrasound uh, ahead of time uh, to assess for any calcifications within the scar tissue. And it's important that the patients are aware of all the non-medical, uh, medical and surgical uh, treatment options for Peyronie's disease so they can make an informed decision uh, on their treatment plan. Uh, the most worrisome risk of Zyflex, again, is penile fracture or rupture of the penile tissues, uh, but fortunately can be managed conservatively uh, most of the time. Next slide. Uh, this slide I won't talk too much about. Uh, you know, Zyflex uh, is most commonly used in the United States because of its coverage. However, in countries like Canada, where Zyflex is not covered, uh, we have colleagues that uh, may or often use some of these medications, interferon or verapamil, uh, but lower success rates uh, than Zyflex. Many, uh, many of you may have seen uh, the advertisements, uh, commercials on TV in regards to low intensity shock wave or gains wave. Um, there's been a, a, a big um, kind of uh, awakening uh, or a lot of patients are coming in asking about this sort of treatment and have been told that it is effective uh, against Peyronie's disease. However, uh, per the American Urologic uh, Associated Guidelines, there really is not uh, enough evidence uh, or really no evidence uh, to say that low intensity shock wave can help improve curvature uh, in Peyronie's patients. And so we do not offer uh, this treatment at the Cleveland Clinic for this indication. However, we do offer it uh, for ED um, and also for pain. Uh, now, 
it has been shown to be effective for men that have pain associated with Peyronie's disease, but again, is not covered by insurance, uh, so can be uh, fairly expensive. And so we typically uh, recommend uh, anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen for that issue. Radiation therapy, again, should also not be offered to treat Peyronie's disease. And uh, vacuum erection devices, uh, while there is some data, uh, I typically recommend uh, the Restorex or traction device uh, as opposed to the vacuum erection device in, in this situation. Along again, uh, new restorative treatments along the, the lines of low intensity shock wave, uh, the P shot or stem shell treatments. Again, no evidence to support their use in Peyronie's disease, and we do not currently recommend uh, these at the Cleveland Clinic. And lastly, um, you know, erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease. Uh, it's a common uh, point of contention. What came first is was it the erections uh, and the erectile dysfunction causing the Peyronie's disease or the Peyronie's disease causing the erectile dysfunction? Uh, regardless, we know the scarring uh, can prevent blood from being trapped in the penis, uh, which can uh, lead to a condition called venous leak, which does not allow patients to maintain uh, the erection. Um, for men with mild or moderate erectile dysfunction, this can hopefully uh, be overcome with the use of medications like Viagra and Cialis. Uh, vacuum erection devices or, or penis pumps, again, low success rate and satisfaction overall. Uh, and then penile injection therapy, um, we uh, advise against in Peyronie's patients uh, as the injections that are, uh, are into the penis that may potentially worsen the scar tissue and worsen uh, the Peyronie's disease. And lastly, uh, surgery with the penile implant, with Dr. Bayach will also discuss, uh, is for men with uh, severe ED uh, who, who fail uh, medications. Next slide. All right, so Dr. Bayach will now take over and discuss the surgical management of Peyronie's disease. All right. So, who is a good candidate for surgery? Well, first of all, it's important to be in that stable phase, meaning the deformity is not getting worse. Any man who has compromised sexual function due to the penile deformity or and or poor rigidity, anybody who's failed conservative therapy, and importantly, any man who desires the most rapid and reliable correction of the deformity. Next slide. It's important to have realistic expectations about what surgery can achieve, okay? Any surgery has risks. So, even though surgery is the most likely to correct the penile curvature, as we'll get into, the goal is a functionally straight penis, okay? I tell any man that's, you know, looking to get a perfect arrow straight penis that although we always make sure it's arrow straight in the operating room, that through the healing process, a little bit of that curvature may return. We know that you have this abnormal healing condition called Peyronie's disease. So it, it's really important that, that deformity be stable, meaning unchanged for six months before having any kind of surgery, because we don't want to fix it and then it get worse on its own. It's possible that you could lose further length um, with surgery. However, using traction therapy afterwards for some of these surgeries can help to prevent that. Erectile dysfunction can be something that can be caused by surgery, and it depends on which surgery you choose. Some are actually used as a treatment for ED. In general, um, for men uh, that don't also have an ED treatment at the same time, erect new erectile dysfunction can happen at about 5% of men for one surgery, and as we'll talk about, a higher rate for another type. But most of these men that do get some worsening of erections related to surgery respond to oral medications like Viagra and Cialis. Penile sensitivity and numbness is, is very uncommon. Um, when it does happen, it's 95% of the time very temporary. Permanent sensation changes are exceedingly rare and essentially almost never um, compromise a man's ability to orgasm and ejaculate. Next slide. So there's been a lot of different of these kind of um, algorithms that have been proposed for when to do which type of surgery. And the bottom line is there's no universally agreed upon system for choosing this. So this is this is the one that I personally use. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that briefly. But for a man who has good rigidity with or without medications, 
A procedure called a tunica albuginea plication is performed for any man with a curvature less than roughly 60 degrees and a man and he shouldn't have any sort of narrowing or girth loss deformity, which we do sometimes see. Hinge effect just basically means with attempted penetration, the penis buckles because it's unstable. And as I'll get into in a moment, application is basically just using stitches to correct the curvature. The ne next procedure is called incision or partial plaque excision and grafting. This is for more complex curvatures, which I define as over 60 degrees or anybody that has a destabilizing girth loss deformity, like a narrowing or an hourglass shape. And for any man that has a very poor erection, a penile prosthesis implantation with straightening maneuvers would be the recommended approach. Next slide. So a tunica albuginea application or a TAP procedure uses sutures or stitches to essentially shorten the longer surface of the penis. So if you imagine in the image there on the right, that the top surface of the penis has already been shortened by the Peyronie's disease. If we use stitches to, to shorten the underside of the penis, then the two surfaces will be of the same length and the penis will be straight. There's a lot of different techniques that have been proposed, but as you might imagine, one of the risks is that you could lose length. So it's important that the man have adequate penile length. Next slide. So some of the pros and cons, it's simple. This is a procedure that takes less than an hour. My average patient does not use any pain pills afterwards and you go home the same day. It's minimally invasive. The risk of erectile dysfunction from this procedure is less than 5%. Um, the risks are that you could lose further length beyond what you've already lost. Um, and it's really only best for the less severe curvatures. If you were a very severe deformity or if you had that hourglass type shape, it may not be the best solution. Next slide. Now, the next procedure is called plaque incision or partial excision and grafting. Okay, so two variations of what's really the same procedure. We call it either a pig or a peg. What we do is we actually cut the scar tissue to release it, thereby allowing that shortened surface of the penis to expand and restore closer to its natural length. Uh, then there's basically a hole there that we need to fill with a material called a graft. So if you see the image there on the right, there's essentially a cut that's made into the scar tissue. And then that cut, which is kind of a line, becomes a rectangular defect. And then we basically cover that with a patch called a graft that's stitched into place. Now, this isn't something you would see from the surface of your penis. This is done through a circumcision type approach. So all of this, and as well as the stitches in the prior procedure are all under the skin. So looking at you from the outside, you wouldn't know you had anything like this done. Next slide. Critical for the pig and peg procedure is that the man must have excellent preoperative erections, okay? And we'll get into why that is in a moment. This procedure is the best opportunity to correct very severe curvature, very severe length loss, or severe girth loss, like an hourglass deformity. It's probably best for men who have extensive plaque calcifications, and for men, like I said, that have severe length loss, because it's the least likely procedure to result in further length loss. Um, it, it can potentially even improve length compared to where the man is when he first comes to see us, and that's with or without the use of the traction therapy device afterwards. Next slide. So here's an example of a man that had 120 degree upward curvature with an hourglass deformity. There in the middle of the shaft, it was narrowed down all the way around and he underwent a PEG procedure. Next slide. And this is him about two years post-op with complete correction of the curvature and that hourglass shape as well. Next slide. So what are the risks of this approach? The risks numbers one through 10 are that there's a chance of diminishing the rigidity, meaning worsened erection hardness. 30% of men who undergo this procedure get some degree of erectile dysfunction. However, the vast majority of those guys do just fine with a Viagra or a Cialis, okay? The other risks are that there may not be a complete correction of the curvature. Like I said, although we make the penis arrow straight in the operating room, we cannot predict the healing process and some amount of that curvature may come back. Um, there's always a chance of losing further length because like I said, you, if you have Peyronie's, we can't predict your healing. But like I said, this is the least likely procedure to result in further length loss. 
And then because we have to typically lift up some of the nerves and arteries on the top surface of the penis to cut the scar tissue underneath, there's a chance of diminished sensation or hypersensitivity that, like I said before, is generally very temporary, usually a few weeks, if at all, very rare that it would last longer than that. Next slide. Now, the last surgical procedure that I'll talk about is something called a penile implant or a penile prosthesis with straightening maneuvers. This is for when a man does not have adequate erections or he's very high risk for developing erectile dysfunction with some of these uh, other procedures that we just discussed. For example, a man with very poorly controlled diabetes is very likely to get worsening of erections, even if he didn't have Tyrone's disease. So a penile implant is actually the oldest treatment that we have for ED, okay? And it's used most commonly in men just that have erectile dysfunction who don't respond to other treatments. It's been around since the 1970s, and it has the highest satisfaction rate of any treatment option for erectile dysfunction. And essentially the way the implant works is it allows a man to get rigid. As far as the Peyronie's disease goes, it'll straighten some of the curvature just by itself or at the same time as the implant is put in, the penis can actually be bent in the direction opposite the curvature. We call that modeling. And then if that isn't enough to correct the deformity, another option is to perform that pig or peg procedure where we actually cut the scar tissue over top of the implant, thereby correcting the deformity, maximizing length and girth in that area that's been shortened by the scar, and also providing 100% reliable erection on demand when you want it with the implant. Next slide. So how does an implant work for erectile dysfunction? Well, this is a completely internal device that's inside of the penis. If somebody saw you from across the room, they would never know you had anything done, okay? The way you control it, the way you get hard is by feeling between the testicles for a pump that's hidden inside the scrotal sac. It's kind of like a third testicle. And you basically squeeze that over and over and over again. And after about two to three minutes, the penis gets hard. Okay, what it's doing is it's moving fluid from an internal reservoir or storage balloon that's hidden behind your belly muscles into these two cylinders inside the penile shaft. It's basically just salt water that's filling these balloons kind of like an inner tube in a bike tire. That erection it basically fills out the penis like a normal erection would, and then it's maintained until you press a little release valve down in your scrotal sac. That'll allow the fluid to come out of the cylinders, the penis gets soft, and it pushes that fluid back into that same storage balloon behind the belly muscles. This is a one hour outpatient procedure. You're completely asleep and numbed up for it. And once again, similar to the other procedure, my average patient for this doesn't use any pain pills. As far as how effective are these implants for the treatment of erectile dysfunction specifically, 98% of men report that their erections are either excellent or satisfactory. And after seven years, 94% of these are still in use and free from any kind of revision surgery. They're meant to last for life. I tell guys they have roughly a 15 to 20 year life expectancy. Um, some men may have to have them replaced, but that's pretty uncommon, less than 15% within the first 10 years. Next slide. So here on the, on the right, you see the implant inside of the body. There's inside the penile shaft, you see one of the cylinders there. It's connected to this pump down in the scrotal sac. That the bottom is what you squeeze to get hard. And then that little button on the top is what you squeeze to get soft. And then when you're not hard, the fluid is stored in that storage balloon towards the top of the graphic that's hidden behind the belly muscles. And if you look at the image on the left from the outside, you would never know that that man had that implant inside of there. Next slide. So what are the benefits? It's the only permanent solution for ED. It allows a man to be spontaneous and have, have sex whenever the mood strikes without having to take a pill or use a device or use an injection. And the erection can last as long as you want without causing any harm. Um, it's completely inside of the body. Nobody would know you have it. It's got the highest patient and partner satisfaction of any treatment option for ED. And importantly, it does not interfere with ejaculation, orgasm, sensation, or urination. All those things are the same. We've been using these for over 50 years, and there's 30,000 of these implanted every year in the United States. Next slide. Insurance covers this, okay? It's the only treatment option, essentially, for ED that's covered, and that includes Medicare and Ohio Medicaid and most private insurance companies. 
However, we always make sure that it's covered before doing any kind of surgical procedure. And then unlike pills and injections, once you have the implant, there's no recurring cost. Next slide. This is a surgical procedure, so there are some risks, okay? First of all, you wouldn't get spontaneous erections, meaning if you got turned on up here, nothing would happen in the penis unless you pumped the device up, okay? If you ever, for some reason, wanted to get the device removed, it's not like you can go back to Viagra at that point. Most guys who are going for an implant, Viagra's already not working, so that's usually not a concern. Um, like I said, 10 to 15% chance of having to have some kind of revision procedure, either the device stops working and needs to be replaced, you know, that's within 10 years time. Uh, short term pain is variable. Uh, everybody is a little bit different. Some guys have no pain at all. Um, we, we use a variety of medications, you know, like anti inflammatories and things like that to help prevent pain and using a lot of nerve blocks as well. Uh, most patients, like I said, use between 0 and 5 prescription pain pills. As far as length change afterwards, there is a risk of losing further length with the implant procedure, but that's typically less than half an inch. If you were also having, let's say, a plaque incision and grafting at the same time, that would give you the least likelihood of losing further length and even potentially restore some of the length that you've lost due to Peyronie's. The risk of infection is very important. That risk ranges from 1 to 3%. If there's an infection, just like a knee replacement, we've got to take it out, okay? We give antibiotics before, during, and after to help prevent that. There's also always a risk that some of that curvature may return. That's typically less than 20 degrees. Next slide. So in conclusion, the preoperative assessment and that initial evaluation is really important to help you determine what the best treatment options for you might be. Non-surgical therapies are great, but if you're looking for a straight penis, that's typically when you're thinking about surgery, okay? Like I said, surgery is most likely to correct the deformity. If the erections are good, you're a candidate for a plication or a grafting procedure, and if the erections are weak, you may be better served with a penile implant. And if you end up having a grafting um, procedure, and let's say, you know, you didn't want the implant, but you just wanted to give it a try and see if, you know, you may have the good erections afterwards, and if, let's say, you have poorly controlled diabetes or something like that, so maybe the erections were not what you wanted them to be, you can always still get that implant later as a backup plan, okay? All right. And I think we've got about 15 minutes here to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, we, we did receive a number of them submitted beforehand, so we'll do our best to get through those. Um, if anybody is interested in setting up an appointment, either with one of us or one of our other Peyronie's disease specialists, just call that number and we could try to find somebody who is near uh, wherever you live or in a reasonable place that you might be able to drive through. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bayach and Dr. Park for your time and for your expertise. That was fantastic. We do have a couple of previously submitted questions as well as a couple in the chat box here. And so we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, first question from the chat box from today uh, that I'll ask Dr. Park and Dr. Bayach, is traction therapy effective in the stable phase of Peyronie's disease? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, while uh, during the talk, I was primarily focusing during the active phase. Uh, I do oftentimes, uh, or it is used in the stable phase as well. You know, many men come in, don't necessarily come in during the active phase. A lot of guys come have waited, put it off. They come in two years later, um, 18 months later when things are stable, uh, but it's still a reasonable option. And, and the data shows that it, it is still able to improve uh, the degree of curvature in the stable phase. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, that if, if there's any of these that I almost to everybody recommend, it's the traction device. I'm a huge believer in it. And, and like he mentioned, it's because it's one of the only treatments that can restore length. Okay. And, and that's one of the things I find guys are most bothered by with this condition, but critical to set realistic expectations when it comes to improving curvature. The traction device is not going to result in a straight penis. It's going to improve your curvature by about 20%, not degrees. Okay. So if you have a hundred degree curvature, you're going to end up on average with an 80 degree curvature, which is still going to be bothersome to most guys. However, if you have a milder variant of this, that may be enough to get you functional where maybe before it was too painful for you or your partner to have sex. Now, after the traction device, maybe you can get by. We often combine it with other treatments like either, you know, uh, the Zyaflex injections or any of the surgical procedures 
Um, so a lot of times we use multimodality or multiple different treatments together. Great. Uh, next question is about the um, pig procedure and whether that is the same as extra tunical grafting or whether that's a different procedure. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Baez can speak to that. Yeah, great question. So um, there's one other procedure that we didn't discuss here, which is extra tunical grafting, and that's different. Okay, that's a newer uh, technique that's been described. It's something that we do also offer to select candidates. Ex if you imagine, um, you know, the penis that's kind of got this narrow, let's say a narrow area, extra tunical grafting is almost, I use it, the, the um, analogy, it's almost like spackling a wall. Okay, you're, you're kind of mudding in or filling in a defect so that it gives a very uniform appearance. But at the end of the day, that chamber inside that fills with blood is still narrowed. So it doesn't necessarily give you that structural stability. Okay. And that's, and that's, you know, our, our best understanding of how this works because this is a newer procedure. It hasn't really been studied for long, you know, durations of time to really see how well men do. Uh, there's slightly, there's less risk with that procedure to the erection. So that's when we do offer it to guys that we don't think would be a good candidate for the pig or peg procedure. But the difference with the pig or peg is really that we're cutting that scar tissue to release it and then filling in that that gap with a graft. OK, so I hope that answers your question, but I, you know, I'd be happy to discuss that further if there are any other questions about it. Yeah, great. Next question, uh, maybe Dr. Parra can help. Can Viagra Cialis make this condition worse in either the stable or the active phase? So that's that's also a good question. You know, while we often put patients on Cialis, um, the daily dose of Cialis, and also encourage patients to use uh, Viagra Cialis um, if they have issues with erections, I think the main thing and what I counsel patients on is we want to avoid further bending or microtrauma to the penis. So if the if the erection is not rigid enough. Uh, that allows for a, a little bit more potentially more bend in the penis. So with particular sexual positions with the woman on top or with manual stimulation with bending of the penis, uh, that can that's more than likely than anything else to worsen the condition. So really, by taking Viagra Cialis, we're hoping for a more rigid erection uh, to avoid any any further damage to the penis. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I, I think that sometimes men, you know, they come in thinking that the Viagra made it worse. And, and the reason I think a lot of men think that is because this is a condition that's most apparent with a complete erection, okay? So if you only have a partial erection, you may not even know how severe this is. All of a sudden you take a Viagra, the erection is much stronger and you say, oh my gosh, the Viagra did this to me. Well, it was like that even before the Viagra. So totally agree with Dr. Park. You wanna strengthen the erections to minimize trauma to the penis. It's very difficult to injure a 10 out of 10 erection. Next question is about a recommendation for a traction device. Um, I think despite the fact that it was uh, developed by Mayo Clinic, we would, uh, I think all of us begrudgingly agree that the Restorex device that we discussed today is the best device on the market and uh, is the recommended device because it is FDA approved and there's good quality data behind it. Yeah, these devices have been around for a number of years and the, the prior generations of devices, uh, many of which I used in my training and you know things like that, required three to even eight hours of use per day, which is just insane. I don't know how people were able to do that. This device is the only one that's been shown to be effective in as little as 30 minutes a day, which is much easier to work into your schedule. Ideally, it should be 30 minutes twice a day for a total of one hour. And Dr. Uh, Lundy brought up a good point. We have no sort of financial relationship with them whatsoever. It truly is the best device that's available. Yeah. We're gonna to switch to a couple of previously submitted questions and then we'll get back to the chat box here. Um, the question that we'll address next is about uh, a gentleman with a downward curvature who is in the chronic phase. Can you discuss uh, treatment options, both non-surgical and surgical for men with a downward curvature? So I can, start with just a one comment about downward curvatures is that I find many men who come in with a downward curvature, particularly younger men, it may be a slightly more likely to be a congenital or a curvature that he was born with. So first of all, most important thing is an exam to confirm that there's scar tissue that we can feel, get a good history, you know, from the guy and make sure this is something that, you know, my penis was one way before and now it's newly downward. 
So Dr. Parr can talk a little bit about the non-surgical options for a downward curvature. Yeah, so, you know, Zyaflex, which was one of the injections that we talked about, is not FDA approved or indicated in men that have a downward curvature. Uh, so it's not something that uh, we we uh, would recommend here. Uh, but other devices, you know, like the Restorex, which we already talked about, um, you know, is an option for downward curvature. Uh, but typically with men with downward curvature, uh, you know, we would also, we would, uh, recommend discussing surgical options if, if it was bothersome enough. Yeah, and, you know, the reason that they didn't include men with downward curvatures in those initial studies when they were first testing these drugs was because how close that scar tissue is to the urethra or the tube that you pee through. So the thought was it might make it more likely that the urethra might be injured. However, since those original studies, which were back in like 2011 to 2013, a number of centers around the country have used Zyaflex in carefully selected men who didn't necessarily fit those criteria and have shown it to be safe. So I think at some point that's going to change. I mean, the bottom line is we have some guys who, although surgery might give them the best result, they're just, for whatever reason, not a candidate for surgery. And in those cases, on a case-by-case -case basis, we do discuss you know, even in this situation, sometimes Zyaflex is an option, although it is it is not part of that FDA label of like how it should be best and most appropriately used. Great. Next question is going to be kind of a synthesis of a couple of these questions, but can you speak a bit to what is required for preoperative erections to make someone a candidate for a plaque excision and grafting? And then also, what is the healing and recovery time like and the cost for that procedure? Yeah, all, all great questions. Similar to some of the other things we talked about today, there's no hard and fast rule. It's really about that back and forth discussion, setting realistic expectations and how much of a tolerance a guy has for the possibility of, of not having excellent erections. I mean, I've, I've offered that procedure to guys, you know, who adamantly didn't who adamantly wanted to try that before an implant, even though we, we both knew that it was a very low likelihood of success. So in general, the guys who are the best candidates for the pig or peg procedure, I usually say are guys who get an erection that is definitely sufficient for penetration, either with or without an oral medication, assuming the penis were straight. Okay, so I always tell guys, imagine the hardness, if the penis were straight, would it be hard enough for sex? And if the answer is yes, then they're probably a reasonable candidate for it. The caveats to that are if they're a smoker, no way, they have to quit. If they're a poorly controlled diabetic, they've got to get it under control and keep it under control. Okay, those are really important for success with any kind of grafting procedure. And then the last question I think was, um, there's a question about cost. It should all be covered by insurance, just like the implant. We always run it through. I mean, once in a while we get like an insurance policy that has a blanket exclusion for some of this stuff, but that's very rare. This is a medical condition. It's you know disfiguring to the penis. I mean. Almost all insurance plans, including Medicare, Medicaid, all should cover. And as far as recovery goes, generally about um, one month till you're having sex. If it's a very advanced case, maybe six weeks. Back to the implants for a little bit. We had some questions about the number of implants and the technique of implant that we use. Can you guys speak a little bit about the volume of implants that Cleveland Clinic performs and what particular maneuvers do you perform to? reduce uh, the rate of things like infection. Sure, yeah, I think we could probably both both touch on this as we do do things a little bit differently, but just as an overall uh, view over you know our whole practice at Cleveland Clinic, I mean, we've got a number of people doing implants. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would estimate somewhere in the range of three to 500 implants a year uh, within our group. Um, as far as my own um, way that I do it, as far as infection prevention, I think a lot of this, we all do the same. Antibiotics beforehand in the recover or in the preoperative area, antibiotics during, antibiotics after, okay, uh, and a ton of antibiotic irrigation during the procedure. There's a number of different approaches that you know can be used um, as far as through the scrotum, above the penis, or even through a circumcision approach, and that's really for me a case by case basis. Dr. Park. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Bias completely. Same, same kind of protocol as far as antibiotics go. You know, the implants we use, uh, we are either coated in an antibiotic or we dip in an antibiotic solution. Um, there was, a, I guess, specific question about the, the type of protocol. Um, I use a, a, a modified no-touch technique as well as try to keep the infection rate low. And 
um, by doing all that, you know, our, our infection rates are, are, are less than 1%. Uh, and, and that's, you know, consistent with the literature and uh, particularly, and in, in we're pretty picky on who we choose. So, you know, they have to be the right candidates as far as having their diabetes, blood sugars under control uh, and everything like that. Yeah, and I use that use that same modified no touch technique as well. Next question is about a, a participant today who has a curve that may be congenital and who has no issues with erections and no pain and is still able to have intercourse. Is it reasonable not to treat curves in these in these gentlemen? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I mean that's a good question. We do have a handful of patients that come in, especially with the advertising. Uh, that's going on uh, with in regards to curvature. A, a lot of guys uh, aren't sure if that curvature they have is is anything worrisome. But as Dr. Bayach had said, you know, it's not cancer. It's not going to develop into cancer. Um, obviously, uh, there are treatment options for the curvature, but all the treatments have potential risks. Um, so, in, in this particular situation, where the, the patient has very good erections, is able to penetrate, not having pain. Um, you know, really wouldn't recommend uh, anything from my standpoint. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it, it, it's as simple as is two reasons to do anything. Number one is it interferes with sex. Number two is you don't like the way it looks. Okay, there's something to say about your own body self image. You know, people do all sorts of things to be happy with the way that they look. And if you, if your the appearance of your penis is a source of stress either for you or in your you know relationship. It's very reasonable to consider correcting it when it comes to congenital curvature. And this is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. Most of these treatments do not apply because a lot of these treatments, you know, things you heard about today, like injectable medicine to break down scar tissue, congenital curvature that has nothing to do with it. I mean, congenital curvature, you're just born with one surface of the penis is more stretchy than the other. Usually for congenital curvature, we're talking about a plication procedure, meaning using some stitches to straighten it out. And that is very effective for those men. Um, but the really the only reason to do that would be, like I said, if it's interfering with sex or if you don't like the way it looks. I think because of time, we're running short on uh, on, on time here. But um, the last question that I have in the chat for you is, are there any options to improve girth, particularly post surgical options? So, um, this is a little bit of a tricky area because there are effects that Peyronie's can have on girth. Okay. And then there are just overall concerns about that a man may have about the girth of his penis that may have nothing to do with Peyronie's disease. In general, for men who are just looking for, you know, having a thicker penis or a girthier penis, but who don't have Peyronie's disease, we generally do not recommend any kind of surgery for that because the risks tend to far outweigh the benefits. For men that have girth loss due to Peyronie's disease, it really depends on the severity of it. It's kind of a nuanced question. Most of the guys that have some girth loss deformity either have like an indentation or more of like an hourglass shape or maybe a segment of the penis is narrow. Um, and some of these techniques that we talked about, like the plaque incision or partial excision and grafting or even the extra, extra tunical grafting can be helped, you know, can help to correct those things. If it's just an overall girth loss of the penis with a full excellent erection, that's a pretty difficult um, problem to correct. Now we've done some kind of creative ways of grafting and things like that in select cases, but it's really a case by case basis. And it further, I wanna emphasize the point of the importance of being evaluated, you know, by somebody that does a lot of Peyronie's disease going through, you know, the various options that are available and trying to pick which one might be best for your individual case because there's not two cases that are identical. And then I wanted to make just one comment because I saw uh, briefly it popped up on my screen. Somebody was asking about whether or not this is going to be recorded. So this is this is going to be recorded. It should end up um, on the Cleveland Clinic YouTube page at some point, and it'll also end up on uh, our own individual Cleveland Clinic biography pages at the very bottom under related videos is usually where you can find this. But anybody who registered should ultimately get a link uh, to be able to watch this later. I encourage you to watch it with your partner, you know, share it with your friends. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about this condition and a lot of great and effective treatments that we have that many guys just may not know about. Great. Well, I think in the interest of time, we'll wrap up here. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Parikh. 
and Dr. Bayich. I think this was fantastic. And as Dr. Bayich said, we're always here. We're able to help. Um, we would love to see you and discuss your specific care for your patients, uh, for yourself individually. Um, thank you very much and have a good, good evening.